All right, good evening, everybody. We're meeting with my friend, Foster Goldstrom, who I have known since the beginning of time. 40, at least 40 years. Is it really 40 years? All right, Foster, let's get started. There are a bunch of questions I've always wanted to ask you. So we're gonna, we'll get to those. I'm gonna see if I can hide those in the more substantive questions. Um, where were you raised? Uh, I was born in Palm Springs, California. Nobody's born in Palm Springs. Does that explain everything? I was to die, but, but most likely I was reincarnated um, and uh, I, I came up an old soul. Amazing, and did you grow up in Palm Springs? Uh, I spent two years there, then moved, uh, my parents moved to uh, near Pasadena, where I, where, where I grew up in palm trees and beautiful homes and so on and so forth. And, um, and then, uh, my parents moved to San Francisco, couldn't afford San Francisco, so they uh, bought a little house uh, in South San Francisco, the industrial city by the San Francisco airport, and uh, lived there for 20 years. I lived there for 20 years and hated every single moment of it. And, uh, and my parents were just government employees and they could never afford anything. And, uh, but I just, for some reason, always liked wonderful things. And I said, you know, when I grow up, I'm going to figure out how to become wealthy and I'm going to buy the most beautiful things there are wherever I can find them. Wh wh whatever it is, I'm going to surround myself with intense beauty. So did, 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 uh, you, come out. did you think you were going to be an artist? Was being an oh, artist? No, no, I did a drawing once in the seventh grade. The teacher gave me an F. <laughs> okay, so you wanted to be surrounded by beautiful things. By beautiful things. I didn't know what they were, but uh, my old father always said, oh, a Stratus Vi Strata Various violin is the best violin. A Rolls Royce is the best car. Uh, and he always, a Van Gogh is, is, is a great painting. I go, hmm, these would be nice things to have. Okay, this is when I was seven, eight years old. And, uh, but, you know, they, they, I could, my parents couldn't even afford a bike. Can I have a bike? No, can't afford it. And so, um, were you finally, an only child? Did you have siblings? I had a sister. I had a sister. And she was, she was did, she have, did she have similar interests? No. So how did you get to be you? How did you manifest this? What did you? Oh, do? No, it was very, very interesting because you know, growing, I grew up in the suburbia, and I had absolutely no idea who I was because I thought differently, I acted differently. I have a Jewish background. Um, I was never religious. My parents were never religious whatsoever. But, um, you know, Jewish people think differently. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a more open, kind of generous thinking about how things could work in the world, uh, how perhaps you can help uh, other people um, in the world. And, um, uh, and then my parents were always helping people in, in the world and through the charitable organizations they work. And so... Uh, and growing up in the suburbia, which is beer drinking, car racing, fighting, football, was just not my world. And so I uh, didn't go to college uh, because I had terrible grades and was severely dyslexic. And uh, one of the reasons I didn't go to college was the Janssen History of Art, which right. just, had just come out in uh, 1962. And it cost $20. That's all I made on my paper route at the time, a month. And I go, the hell, and I can't read. And so I said, I forget it, and I'm not going to school. But strangely enough, skipping ahead 22 years later, somebody calls me up, Foster, you see the new Janssen History of Art? I go, no. He said, go buy it. I go, I didn't buy it uh, 22 years ago. I was not going to buy it now. But you'll buy it now. So went and bought it, and Color Plate 1 in Janssen History of Art, the 1984 version, is a sculpture by John DeAndrea, which I own, collection Foster Goldstrom. I go, yeah, I guess you don't have to go to school to make art history. So how did you come, how did you, how did money find you? Very interesting. Um, so I worked, my last paying job is I sharpened pencils on the floor of the Pacific Stock Exchange in San Francisco. And one day a friend of mine came and said, Foster, I'm, I want to go to a gallery. I need some art for my house. Um, do you, you, you want to go with me? Because I, I don't know anything. I just need somebody to you know, sit there with me. So I went with them and uh, they sat down on the couch and they made the display on the floor of these Salvador Dali prints. And they go, well, Mr. Wendell, what do you think about these Salvador Dali prints? I go, Harold, these would look beautiful on your living room wall. And they go, hey, would you like a job here? I go, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I quit my job sharpening pencils. 
And a couple days later, showed up at the gallery and sold a painting for $100, and they need another salesman. So then uh, I said, well, you really want a salesman? I said, my wife, who had just been married for six months, and I go, she's a salesperson. She, she, her, her family works in a flea market. She's, they sell or die. And so she came and worked for the gallery. And so from making $300 a month for me sharpening pencils, we started making $3,000 a month. And so then I started buying art from the gallery, which was uh, Benny Buffano and Salvador Dali, the things that they showed. And so then the Buffano had the nerve of dying like a month later. Right. And his, his prices went up. And I started selling the, Salvador, uh, the, uh, the Buffanos. And for every Buffano I sold, I bought a Picasso or a Chagall. How did you know what to buy? How did uh, you know I've, I've never read an art book. It was, there's, it's just something where the information comes down and w whatever I touch just turns into something important, ends up on the cover of an art history book, in an art history book. And um, I have no idea where the, where the information comes from. I can look at one out of a million objects and go, that's the one. And did you buy things based on quality or based on an intuitive sense or based on supposed monetary investment? What? Well, you know, uh, I, since I, I've never had any money, whenever I spent a nickel, on, on, even today, whenever I spend any money, I think of it as an investment, whether I'm going to the store, buying some food, um, buying a car. Is, is this money well spent? And... Um, and, and that, to me, is very, very important, of making a, uh, a conscious decision of, of how to spend money. I just, I just don't spend money on frivolous things. It all makes sense. Um, and so I, I just bought, I looked at art. Well, what I, what I did, I, I, I created an evaluation system somewhere in my mind of knowing and looking at pictures and understanding what great pictures were. And then I would look at something else, another work of art of somebody that wasn't known or uh, that wasn't as well known or was under. And I'd say, hmm, these have similar qualities of, of paint. Uh, they have uh, similar qualities and in intellectual process. Um, it's well done. Um, and it, it tells a story about a particular time and place in a culture that can be looked at uh, in 5, 10, 15, 25, 50 years, 100 years from now, and could possibly become the cultural language of that society. And when you have that, you have a chance of uh, the artwork becoming important. If it's discovered by other people that write about art, that uh, show art, that um, works becoming in museums and ending up in art history books. And so... Uh, when you kind of understand that, uh, when, you, when you look at a work of art, uh, you can cut out a lot of material by saying, oh, this, this person this is an artist, he doesn't know how to paint, but is he really painting something that tells about a particular time and place where he lives that will be understood and become the, again, the cultural language of, of, of that society? So you worked for this other gallery for a while, which wasn't... Um... It was a commercial gallery. It was a tourist gallery in, in San Francisco, uh, one on Fisherman's Wharf, another one on Geary Street. But then you opened your own gallery, ultimately. Yeah, uh, yeah. So I worked there for six months. Um, then we, we quit and we sold our Buffanos, bought Picasso's, Cezanne's, and Degas, and, and stuff. And then they went way up in value. And um, then started to focus on uh, American art in 1973 uh, because nobody liked American art. Come out, so come out. You move the camera so that I only see your lips and not your head. Okay, good. <laughs> and, and so, <laughs> uh, so then um, uh, I, we started buying uh, Wayne Tebow's and Sam Francis's for $100 a piece. And you, but, all right, but I, I, I feel like, all right, how long did you have your gallery? Uh, well, okay, so we're private dealers from 1973 to 1977, and then uh, a friend of mine, uh, Cy uh had a gallery on Grant Avenue in San Francisco in a beautiful old building. So I was visiting him one day, and he goes, Foster, I'm, I'm getting out of this gallery. I'm going to move across the street to a much bigger place. And he goes, would you want to take this gallery over? And I go, huh, that would be interesting. And I go, how much is the rent? He goes, $400 a month on wow. Grant Avenue in San Francisco. And I goes, yeah, you can have it. 
And so I, I called up uh, my former wife, Monique, and I go, Monique, we have a, we have a calorie for $400 a month on Grant Avenue. She goes, take it. So we took it and we, we opened, you know, showing our Chagalls and Hundred Vasser and Picassos. And, and then after a couple of years, decided that was all boring. We wanted to have younger artists. That, and then, so we started showing uh, younger artists. And all right, but you, I, I remember you have taking an, what I would call a stance with certain iconographic works of art and making a taking a large position in certain specific. I mean, I think of Bob Arneson, for example, and a uh, sculpture of Moscone. The, right, the, the portrait of George the, called the Moscone bust. Um, well, a, again, when, when we were selling these, you know, works of art, the Picassos and the Chagalls and the Hundred Vossers, um, I was always looking around for iconic works of art. And so uh, I started uh, collecting uh, these major paintings and sculptures that would kind of float by us that, uh, you know, Wayne Thiebaud, uh, Robert Arneson, Louise Nevelson, um, uh, they'll just list when I'm Malevich and and then and and, and 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 so I just recognize them as being the quintessential objects the very finest objects that define that artist's career and uh, I, I bought uh, a, a lot of those things and uh, built a very very powerful uh, personal collection but sometimes, uh, which, sometimes you would then put them up for sale and have prices that were out of line and ultimately get it they, they, they might have been, you know, twenty percent over the market, but I knew if, if you have something really great, it would command a, a bigger price. But nobody would ever buy them from me, thank God. An, an art dealer becomes wealthy from the things he can't sell. Well, that's true. <laughs> all right, so then, all right, and then we start. Then, then I moved away, and we lost touch. And what the hell have you been doing since then? Well, uh, unfortunately, uh, I, I, my, we got divorced, and I lost about eighty percent of the the collection. Uh, the masterworks of 20th century art, and I was left over with the remnants. Um, and you know, I've been I've been collecting, you know, younger artists that I find here in the Bay Area, and uh, most likely, and again, I, I I live in Vienna, you know, part of the year, and I I, I travel constantly. Just came back from a month in France, um, so I basically I just manage my collection, and maybe once every five years or so, sell something that's sort of iconic and I still have. So your money has basically come from buying well and selling better. Yeah. yeah. No, I started with $10. The first work of art I bought was $10. And everything is built on that $10. And, and if you're a, a group a class a symposium uh, would look that, like to see the way that uh, I live, uh, they can go to www.sf. Bay Venue, one word, SF Bay Venue, and they can see the Maybeck House, which is uh, has some of the art just shown in it, Cezanne, Paul Clays, and shit like that. Cezanne, <laughs> Paul Clay, and shit like that. Um, okay, hold on. I'm going to put the link up here in the chat box for them and send this out to the world here. And all right, there you guys can click on that while we continue talking. Um, you have a gorgeous house, dude. Um, all right, so I, I, I was able to save that in the divorce. I, I end, ended up with the house in the divorce, and again, it's one of the most beautiful houses ever conceived. We're celebrating our hundredth anniversary this year. It's built in 1914, but it's so avant-garde in the middle of this incredible park uh, with uh, ancient thousand-year-old redwood uh, glass windows. It's a garden pavilion that looks out on this ancient garden, California garden. And I've owned it for 35 years. Let's talk about the yeah. art world. Okay. So you and I uh, well, were out in the art world in the 70s. And it's yeah. totally the same as it was then. Nothing has changed, right? No, it's, it's a whole new, whole new world. All right. Whole so what's world. changed? Why has it changed? Where is it going? And what do artists do about it? Oh, that, that, that is, you know, it's all about you know, connections um, of, you know, being able to, uh, you know, meet people, you know, you know the, the, the mega galleries are, are the ones that are doing, you know, extremely well, uh, you know, Devotions, Werner, uh, 
Uh, and, and the other people, <laughs> Ennis Mitchell, Ennis, Ennis, and um, and then I think you know galleries that can control their expenses, that have a a nice program, that uh, that have a nice following of, of people, um, you know, are are, are surviving. They're, they're not getting rich, but it, it's uh, it, it, it's really. And, and it's, there's, there's a wonderful program, uh, 60 Minutes, Morley Safer, uh, about the Miami Basel Art Fair. You don't think he was a schmuck in that thing and that, he, that it was wonderful? You, you, you liked that. Oh, no, it, it, it was, it's so infight, insightful about the art world today. The interview with uh, Blum and Poe, uh, the collectors. There, there was this one uh, couple that come out. Oh, oh, we we collect art. Oh yeah, we love art. Oh, and we bought over a thousand pieces of art. And and more than the Well, what, did all of them are all good investments? He goes, No, I, I wish I could throw those away or burn them or bury them in my backyard. I go, What an asshole. Yes. <laughs> But, and so then, you know, uh, and then uh, uh, Blum and Poe, uh, I forgot Blum's first name. The son Irving. of, I think, son of, no, the son of Irving. All right, all right. yeah. Blum, uh, he goes, you know, I, I deal with the wealthiest people, you know, around the world. He goes, like the 1%, he goes, no, the 1% of the 1%. And they really don't know anything about art. But we advise them you know, to buy this and that, and their friends see it. Oh, I have to have that too. And we're talking $250,000 a piece and up. And when you go and see their program, you go, what is this shit? <laughs> what, 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 what is this? This is art. They're, they're big, giant installations that, to me, don't mean anything. And, um, but, I, but, you know, people really don't understand what, what, what art is and what it's supposed to do and, and the cultural meaning and how it should make your life more joyful and more creative and, you know, give you a greater understanding of the universe that artists put into their paintings, the messages they put into their paintings, that uh, as one's intellect grows, that you all of a sudden, some of these secret messages are exposed in the artist's uh, uh, works, sculptures, paintings, videos, you know, wh whatever it is. Don't you, find, artist, don't you find that the so-called art world is stratified? I mean, we talked to somebody that talks about there being different art villages. And I oh, think, absolutely. And I think for most artists, the art world of the 1% is irrelevant and that there are still many artists and many galleries that are pursuing more substance and meaning in the art that they, that they create. And there are galleries that are selling art because this is what they believe in. And maybe they're having difficulty making money. But you know, to an extent, I think that the art world is more stratified than it used to be. And it's the, the middle galleries are getting squeezed Squeezed. There's a million galleries that are really, uh, you know, getting squeezed in there. Uh, Stephen Wirtz just closed uh, a week or two ago. Uh, George Kresge in San Francisco just closed uh, a few months ago. And so there's a lot of galleries uh, closing. They're being forced out of their spaces in San Francisco. The tech companies are buying up the buildings or renting the buildings. And so, but these guys have been in business for 40 years. And, it, you know, it's really, I mean, the, the amount of work to do, uh, to have a gallery and just, you know, show up there every day and, and wait for, you know, people to show up. Uh, and, you know, the bills, I mean, to have a, a decent good sized gallery, I think at least would cost at least $100,000 a month. So what are, our, what are artists to do? What are artists to do? Well, you know, the, the new, you know, online and electronic, you know, media, uh, it, it, it's creating a buzz. You know, my, my daughter is a, uh, uh, a singer, you know, mildly successful, mildly successful. I mean, she gets shows around the world, but she doesn't make any money. Um, and so, but the, the key to it is linking up with a, a commercial venture in this country and, you know, getting your song signed onto, uh, you know, an advertising thing or uh, having a corporate sponsor to uh, do it. So, with, but with artists, it's, you know, I, you know, it's, 
possibly getting online, you know, finding people to, uh, you know, to support you by, by your work and uh, create websites. And, it, and it's really also just connecting, going around and putting yourself in places where you would think people would be that would be interested in buying your artwork. And if you're lucky, you know, you'll, you'll find a, a representative that would uh, want to, you know, help you do that. And hopefully the representative has connections with, with collectors and museums and writers that will be able to uh, promote your work. Uh, I got a call today from a, a woman in Tennessee that, who paints uh, women with uh, brightly colored with, with wings and they're kind of like angels and stuff. And she goes, oh, a gallery contacted me. Uh, I won an award and uh, they want to take me to the Miami Basel Art Fair. I go, uh, they don't show uh, brightly painted women <laughs> with wings on. Uh, and, and they want me to pay $2,500 to do, be able to go to the Miami Basel Art Fair. And so, uh, okay, uh, I, I don't think so. So she did a little more investigation and she found out it was just a scam. The people to milk her to go. So it's, it's, it's being cognizant of, you know, going entering a business deal, uh, making sure that you'll be paid, you know, checking if somebody does offer you a show in a gallery, is this a reputable gallery? Will they, will they pay me if they sell something? Because the artists are basically the weakest link, you know, in, in the chain. I don't know about uh, weakest, most vulnerable. Most vulnerable, thank you. They're the most vulnerable, thank you, uh, in, in there. So um, it, it's a very a difficult field, but, you know, finding your voice, you know, creating a, uh, a, an object that uh, somebody would like to own, uh, somebody that uh, hopefully you can find to represent you, uh, finding somebody that represents you, that has the connections, that can bring you to the forefront of the art world, get art publications, uh, to publish you, get you museum shows, um, and have important collectors. It's, that's the essence of what it becomes to become a, a, a great artist. I think, I, think, I think this is like, well, I, I'm, I'm the, sorry. I feel like, you know, we talk about how the art world has changed so much in the 40 years or so that we've been involved in it, but I feel like there's some constants. And the constants are, and, and, and maybe it's more challenging now where artists need to be more consummate and take on more responsibilities, but I still think it's ultimately about relationships, growing your community, um, being genuine and, you know, not necessarily, I, I don't know, let's talk about trends for a second. Do you look for, do you follow a trend, or do you say, hell with trends, I'm me, here's what I'm doing? Yeah, no, I just look at an individual work of art, and I just see if it's unique, has ever been done before, uh, is, it, is it powerful, does it, does it have a language that is going to create a, a new vision in my life? And so if I were to take you to a, to, a, to a tour of the house and see the young artists that I have, they're, they're totally unique things, they're powerful, images that, uh, that, that, that scream about their time and place and their minds and their understanding of the universe. And they take all that information and bring it down through their minds, their souls, and then create an object which explains their great, great knowledge of the universe through a new language that is uh, uh, few people understand, but I, for some reason, just pick up on it but I could give you a walking tour <laughs> well, I, that'd be fun and I don't think we're going to do it but let's, let's talk okay. so but basically I mean I think that artists should be distinctive and that we're all different individuals and therefore we should be soul searching and looking to ourselves and you know be who we are um, as opposed to being somebody else and seek to be ourselves even more what happens with these art? I mean, all right. So you, you're, you're nodding your head. Yes. You're acquiring yes. art by emerging artists often periodically. What? Oh yeah. No, I, I go out and look at the galleries or I go to artist studios uh, you know, a couple of times a month. And um, you know, most of the times I don't buy something, but I, I buy something you know, perhaps, you know, once a month that um, intrigues me and they're very inexpensive. These are young artists that, uh, first shows, for instance, the artists that I that went to their first shows or even before they had galleries, I saw Jeff Koons at his very first show on the um, East Village. 
I walk in this gallery and they didn't know who, and the, there's this fish tank sitting there with a basketball. And I go, oh my God, that's incredible. Un unbelievable. And as there's another phone ring here, it drives me nuts. Um, I, I go, how much is that? He goes, $3,500. I go, I'll take it. You know, it's sold. Well, I'm there, I'll just make another one. He goes, no, you won't make another one. I said, of course I'll make another one. I'll make another one. No, no. So I, and I, I didn't pester him, but I ended up not buying it. Uh, Charles Ray, Bill Viola, Christian Marclay, uh, James Terrell, all these people before they had galleries, I saw them and I collected their work. And so for nothing, for, for a few hundred dollars. And so now these guys are the, you know, the, the, the gods of, uh, you know, of, of contemporary art. How much interest, people are clamoring to see more art in your house. How, ma how, ma how much, how much is you know, you know, I, It's a very strange karma thing that I have. Um, my wife did the selling uh, while we were married and we got divorced. Uh, and I, I don't do anything. I just manage my collection and once every few years sell something. How much interesting art is sitting within camera range of where you are at the moment? Uh, okay. Well, I, I'll, I'll walk into the living room. Okay. <laughs> Hopefully the signal won't fade because I know it's a little weaker down there. But it's a young artist, Nick Dong. I bought his very, very first piece that he created. Um, and So you don't, know, the artist doesn't necessarily need to have a huge resume for you to be interested. Foster, we're losing you. Oh, here, this is, oh can you hear me? Not, not now? Well at all, no, and the image froze, no. Uh, Anyway, <laughs> I took an old rocking chair and he has three objects floating above the seat of the chair and they, and they spin around. And uh, they're just, you, you look at this and, and on the floating objects, which are kind of biomorphic shape, um, uh, he has wonderful, wonderful pencil drawing of uh, some, uh, looks like minerals, uh, others are cells and others, the other one is architecture. Um, I, I wish I could get, well, there's a video somewhere posted of it, but, um, but it is a, uh, an incredible work. And that's a, just a recent acquisition. Then a new light sculpture by, um, a, an artist, uh, Craig Doherty, who uh, was a, a studio assistant, maybe still a studio assistant of, uh, Jim Campbell and a beautiful light box, which is upstairs, which I could show you that that has a good internet connection but these are things i've bought in the last couple of months that are dynamic beautiful that, that speak to uh concepts of contemporary it ideas. sounds to me like you buy works of art more than artists uh i i buy more works of art than artists uh i mean yeah so i mean you're not particularly caring about the artist's resume no, no, no. They're no, trajectory. You're buying a, work, a given object that really stimulates that you relate to. Exactly. I don't even look at the object. Uh, you know, when, even when artists would come into my uh, gallery, I was the only gallery who would ever look at artists' work. You know, I'd say, yeah, show me your slides. And so, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd look at the pictures and I'd, I'd, I don't care. It's, it's the artwork that speaks to me, the only thing that ever spoke to me. And uh, I, I didn't care if the artist was, was famous. I, I would probably know he was famous, but just unknown people. And if I found a good, I'd give them a show and I'd buy their artwork. I, and generally what I would do, somebody pay me for a work of art, I'd give the, the artist all the money and I would keep, you know, the, the artwork, you know, the, as a commission. I seem to recall, I mean, so you, I, I remember this about you. There was a 50-50 split with the artists and if something sold, you would buy a piece so that basically, yeah, I would give the artist all the money, and I would just buy the uh, buy another piece from. How Still did you that. make How did you make money that way? This is like I, you know, I, I lose money on each piece, but I make it up on the volume. Exactly. No. Uh, again, this is another bizarre, bizarre thing. I have no idea how I make a living. I have no idea. But whatever is needed arrives in the moment it's needed. Whether it's a rubber band to tie up some. Uh, around a, a piece of, 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 of some newspaper or a million dollars. The money just arrives. It's, it's really 
bizarre. <laughs> yeah, it works, you know. It works. It Why works. question that? All right, Sandy, you had a question about studio visits, and I have unmuted you so you can ask it. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I wanted to know how he finds out about the artists that he visits their studios. Oh, it's all serendipity. Just, you know, going to some place and uh, seeing something. I, I have no plan. I, yeah, I, I used to be, try and make plans and nothing ever worked. And I discovered if you can learn how to dream without fear, anger, jealousy, greed, and you give away whatever you can afford to give away, uh, the universe takes care of you. And I've, I'm at that position of, of, of that. And, you, and, and life is a dream. And if you can dream without the sphere, you can see all these doors open up to you. And you go and you find these marvelous things where they just arrive at, at, at your doorstep. But it's living, you're, you're, everything that you're taught your entire life is taught to you about fear and obeying this and that. The government tells you if you don't do this, you're gonna to go to jail. If you don't pay your taxes, you're, this is gonna to happen to you. Religion is if you don't do this, you're gonna to go to hell. Your parents say this, if you don't do this, you won't succeed. And everybody is telling you, if you don't do this, you don't follow this law, and you're, you're, you're going to disintegrate. So I, I learned that this was a giant lie, and uh, I changed my philosophy, I guess, about 20 years ago. And whatever's there, and it's putting yourself in, in the right places. Um, again, life is a stream that passes in front of you, and in that stream is absolutely everything you need to survive and enjoy life. And so you stick your hand in the stream, and you pull up a fish. You go, hmm, fish is good. I, I can eat this. You look at your hand again, oh, this is a lump of wood. This is, this is a, it's dead. That's water, waterlogged. I can't use this. Send this on down the stream. And so it's about making the right decisions, putting yourself uh, in the right place uh, with the right people. Uh, don't be afraid to be lucky. Uh, don't be afraid to uh, expose yourself to, uh, uh, to, to people, uh, your dreams and, and what, what you would like to see happen. And, you know, think of helping them how everything becomes, all I ever want to experience is win-win situation. Uh, that's why, to me, the artist, when I could sell a work of art by an artist, he could live, somebody would buy it, they would gain a whole new beautiful object to live with that would change their lives. And I would sit right in the middle receiving all that love from <laughs> those people who I changed their lives. Win, win, win. Hey, you set out to try and be negative in this discussion, you know, that was, your, but you haven't done that. You've been really beautifully positive. Uh, no, I'm, I, I live a, a very positive uh, out, out, outlook of life, and uh, everything is possible. Um, I just accomplished the impossible in France uh, last week, uh, met with the owners of Romani Conti, which everybody said was absolutely impossible. But I knocked on the door, and they greeted, oh, Mr. Goldstrom, you're here. I go, I am. <laughs> yeah, right, and so, my, my girlfriend of 20 years in Vienna and my other best friend who's a journalist uh, in, in Vienna we, we traveled together and we went to Romani Conti and everybody tells us Foster you'll never you cannot get in you gotta get to watch me and so after 20 years after I got in we had conversations with the, with the winemaker Bernard Nobile and uh, Aubert de Villan um, we came out to go Foster you know we always thought you were full of shit. 20 years, <laughs> 20 years. We always thought you were, now we believe you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know, you're, you're a trip. All right, Harley, you had a good question, Harley, about relationships. Um, Harley, Harley's cold in Melbourne, Australia. You'll have to, you know, I love how he looks. Go ahead, Oops. go ahead, Harley. Oops, I'm muted. Okay. <laughs> um, unmute, unmute. Wait a minute. Unmute. There you go, Harley. I'm back. Hello. Um, I'm just wondering, do you... <laughs> 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 
<laughs> it's cold. It's really yeah, cold. Yeah, is it winter down there or something? It's summer up here. <laughs> it's only 10 degrees. It's not that bad. That's Paul that. keeps telling me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> is that 10 degrees Celsius or Fahrenheit? So, sorry, Celsius. Celsius. It's not bad. Yeah. Yeah, it's not bad at all. I like an Eskimo. <laughs> I get cold easily. I go I surfing see. all the time. I'm freezing. Um, I was just wondering, do you make friends with the artists themselves? Like, do you build a yes. relationship? Or you, yeah, yeah? Absolutely. absolutely, yes. No, uh, because the people, the, I, I'm, I'm friends with, the only people that I really have as friends are creative people uh, that really, wh wh whatever field they're in, um, uh, they're just really interesting creative people, whether it's in wine or architecture or art or medicine or whatever they're just really genuine souls i have zero assholes in my life <laughs> that's unbelievable very few people can say that that's really wonderful um sam i think did you have a question wait a minute yeah, what was your question about really whether you have relationships with artists or you know Yes, no, no, absolutely, I, absolutely. And I have them for dinner all the time. And I, I, I have this beautiful house, if you've seen that SF Bay venue thing. Uh, and I'm just constantly entertaining here and having people from the art world and, and the, the creative world uh, here. Julia Child has been here and uh, the, the major winemakers have been here and uh, our major artists. And matter of fact, the, the people who, have you ever saw the movie Frozen? Or the Book of Mormon, the play. The people who wrote the music were here, stayed in my house while I was in France. Uh, the, the Robert Lopez and Kirsten Lopez. And uh, they wrote a new song for their new movie on my piano. Wow. Um, Daniel, you had a good question. Hold on, i got to scroll some more. Daniel, go ahead. No, I don't play the piano. <laughs> well, first of all, thank you. Thank you for being here. But uh, you should play the piano. You're like... I, no, I can't. I, I can't paint. I can't play. I don't bowl. I don't play football. I can't ski. I don't do motorcycles. I, I just sit around, drink, eat, and entertain people and, and seriously party. That's all I do. Sorry. Not bad. Not bad. Um, well, I was curious about how you feel about artists approaching you directly. Um, oh, no, it's fine. A lot about, you know, it's fine. No, yeah. I'll send, send me an email and, uh, you know, I'll look at your work, have a chat. Yeah. Uh, it, it's, it's, to me, it's very clear that I can send you the directions of, you know, where, you know, you can, you know, who I think that might be able to help you connect up a type of gallery, it's the type of city you'd be, you know, looking at, because each city has its own, you know, kind of direction of the, the way the kind of collectors they developed or in countries and, you know, in Mexico or in, it's becoming a little more evened out now because of the kind of the globalization of, of vision. But still, there's different places that show sure, uh, Absolutely, yeah. That where, where do you live? Where are you at? Um, yeah, near Providence, Rhode Island. But I, ah, I spent you, 20 years in Chicago, and so I'm new here. Uh, hence, I'm figuring this place out. Sorry, hence, hence the books. The voice. What's behind you. <laughs> oh, the books. <laughs> no, what, what's behind you? Well, you know, it's, yes. uh, I can't help it. It's a, it's a pathology. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you lived in L.A., you wouldn't see any books. Right. Nobody isn't too, isn't it? Um, Janice is in your neighborhood. Janice, um, ask your question. Go ahead. Um, do you ever do studio visits? Every once in a while. First, I'll, I'll take a look at the artwork, you know, uh, you know, online to get a, a quick look and see if it's something that uh, that that I would be, you know, possibly interested in seeing. So. But I'll start out, you know, looking like that because I can see the <laughs> conceptual, yeah, of what I, I, I know what I'm not looking for, but I'm always willing to be surprised. Yeah. So, so are you going to give us your email address? <laughs> very simple, it's my name, foster at goldstrom.com. Foster at goldstrom.com. Thank you. Sure. Um, Sam, proceed. Yeah, hi. Um, how do you see uh, the online art world evolving? Do you see uh, that it's, it's, not, it's not a bit, you know, I, I, about a year ago, I did a dinner for a friend of mine who is in technology and she introduces people from around the world and 
they had technology companies and she takes them down to Silicon Valley and introduces them to Google and to this company and that company. She's somewhat connected. So I said, Foster, would you do a dinner in your house for, I don't know, 10 people? I go, of course. And so um, I do a dinner and these people are like you know, between 25 and 35 years old. And this is the first time I had ever seen this. All these people during the entire dinner, they're on their phones, texting, taking pictures of the food and texting <laughs> friends all around the world. They're not talking to each other. They're just texting away. So th this is, uh, unfortunately, uh, the future. It's not real until you see it on your iPad. So yeah, uh, it's, it's, it's very, very important to uh, uh, establish uh, some sort of, you know, place to be seen on the internet and creating buzz you know one way or another uh, but, but would you ever buy a piece online um if i if i knew the uh if i did that, i would look at it then i possibly might see something by the artist i i, I conceptually yes i would buy a piece on online i i would feel strong enough in my understanding of art and, and who's bullshitting and who's, you know, you know, telling the truth or record. Conceptually, yes. Conceptually, yes. But I enjoy seeing it. I, you know, I'm a people person. And I like meeting the artists. I like talking to people and experience the art. It's a, I'm a very, very sensuous person. And so I want to, uh, you know, feel a little more. Feel a little more. Right. Thanks. Thanks, Sam. Um, Alisa. Hold on, I'm scrolling north. Um, there you are, beginning of the alphabet. Go ahead. Hi, thanks for being here, Foster. Um, yeah. I'm just curious how, I mean, with this technology thing, um, it seems contradictory to how we can create real relationships if we're only on our iPads. And um, Well, I, I, that, I, that I, 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 I don't know, uh, but... You know, you just, I guess speak to younger people. Um, <laughs> uh, but you know, the way kids were brought up, you know, being afraid, you don't go out, don't, you can't step into a yard, somebody can kidnap you. You know, no, you, you can't, if you hug, there was a five-year-old kid that was thrown out of school for giving a, a, a little girl a hug. He was, it was called molesting, I mean, a, a hug. I mean, so this society, this government um, has created such fear of intimacy that you, and, and you can see it, how we're being dumbed down to uh, rely on, you know, uh, electronic media to receive information and, and the way it tracks you, um, mm -hmm. you know, and whatever you, 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 when you go on Google, you can see ads coming up. And my God, I, I looked at, thought of buying a camera or going on a vacation. So you're still thinking of going to Paris? You still want the Nikon, you know, D8, what, D18 or something? You go, holy shit. So the, they're building this incredible universe around you um, that will be, you know, designed in artificial intelligence just around the corner. Um, yeah, my... So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> My son and, and his, his ex-girlfriend think they're going to become robots in the future. Uh, well, they, they, might not, they might not be, but they certainly will have them around them. But they can be programmed like uh, robots. About 25 or 30 years ago, I felt that at one point down the road in you know, 30 or so years now, there will be a chip implanted you uh, that will give you all the information that, that you'll need. And it'll be received, and, and it'll be a guide. And, and then at some point, you're just going to be beholden that chip. Oh, I'm hungry. It'll take you to a restaurant, or it'll feed you, or I want to see this now. I want to see that now. And, you know, you can see it coming to fruition. And the only thing I want to know, I wanted to always be a free thinker. I said, well, the only, the only, if they insisted that they put this chip in you, uh, I just want to know the guy who does the programming. <laughs> I came up with that 30 years ago. I want to know the guy who does the program. So maybe this will make real art more valuable. Um, if the programmers want to be. <laughs>
I want, all right, I want to hear Sam's questions about power, or I want to hear uh, Foster's answer, but I want Sam to ask it. Sam, take it away. Yeah, uh, recently I was talking to a curator, and she was talking about the relationship of um, curators, dealers, collectors in the art market, and who is leading the show. Is it the artists? It, like, who, who's... The attention seems to be around the curators, dealers, and collectors as opposed to the artists. So a lot of um, art. Tom, Tom Wolf uh, wrote the book uh, uh, From Our House to Bauhaus. I, be I believe that, or no, The Painted Word, The Painted Word. Um, and basically the way that he stated, now this book was written 35 or 40 years ago, is you know, the art dealers are the people that are really in control of everything. And they select the artists and the, uh, the collectors are the, uh, are, are the parishioners in the church. Uh, the critics are the chorus. They sing the praises, they <laughs> the hallelujah thing. And uh, the museums are, are the churches. Uh, the museum direct, in the museum world, everybody is frightened. If you talk to a curator, they're like, uh, uh, well, I, I, I don't know if, it, if I, I can show your work. Uh, I'm not sure if I can get the uh, support. Well, they're, they're afraid of their job. They're not pleasing the director. The director's afraid of losing his job because he's not pleasing the board. You know, so the board, you know, buys art from the galleries and, um, and they go, yeah, well, we, we got to please, you know, John Smith and his collection. And he wants to have a, you know, Sean Scully show. So uh, let's do a Sean Scully show. He's pretty hot and we get so-and-so to write about it. But it's the art dealers that are, really you know have a tremendous amount of power in the deal but you know big artists like you know jeff coons and uh and and, and the, the the rest of these guys certainly can write their own tickets um and you know and create movement for the uh art art dealers and you know Gerhard richter and uh and the rest of them um but 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 generally and when you look at the list of larry goshen's artists i mean he's got like 300 artists at least that list just goes on and on and on and on and what a mind-blowing sales machine that he's got going it, it's it's right. incredible absolutely incredible um and so my belief is the the, the artist unless you're really big you do have cloud it's like being a big movie star you have cloud but otherwise right. you have to be left with your managers and, and agents Maybe this is the last question, Foster. We're, we were, you know, we're actually pushing an hour here, um, but not quite. We can, if you guys have some more, I, we've got time. Sherry, I want to hear your question. It's a good last one. If there isn't another one, go ahead, Sherry. Um, yes, I was, uh, I was really taken by your laughter. It's so contagious. And I was wondering if you think your positive attitude has been your key to success in the art world. I just... Uh, well, you know, I... I consider myself no. I consider myself a failure in the art world because oh. the, the, <laughs> um, uh, because the, the young artists that I believed in that I supported between 1975 and 1995 uh, really never became superstars. I believe they all had you know wonderful visions uh, that that spoke new languages, but but then the artwork that I bought from the artists that I that I didn't represent. Uh, they became uh, giant successes. And um, <clears throat> to me, uh, being optimistic, being socially, uh, politically aware, um, you know, understanding that no one else is going to be taking care of you. Your government does not have an interest in seeing you uh, uh, be happy or, or well. They just interested in you becoming a sheep and following the line and buying the corporate uh, product and uh, supporting the corporations. We have the best government corporations can buy. So you've got to figure out how to feather your own nest. And again, surrounding yourself with the wonderful people, positive people that, that care about you and that you can uh, think openly with and share joy with uh, is so much more uh, than, than having, uh, you know, a lot of money. A lot of money does not make one happy, but uh, friends that you can discuss things freely, openly with, and share, and uh, create a, a sharing world filled with love and joy. Right. <laughs> Thank you, Sherry. So, Ted, do you have an interesting question? Take it away. Whoops, I missed. There you go. Go ahead. Hi, Foster. Greetings from Pasadena. Uh, oh, hi, hi, hi. 
Uh, Love in Pasadena. So the the previous uh, speaker talked about how um, most people, I forgot what the percentage was, but most people respect art, but do not respect artists. Uh, do you think that's true? Uh, I, I, no, I, 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 first of all, I, I don't think very many people understand or, what art is. You know, it's, it's not taught in the schools. And, you know, I, I, I have a three minute lecture that explains what art is, which I partially did just now, which you will never hear in a school. And it'll sum up seven years of art education and clear the cobwebs out and give you, art is something that a great genius that understands many facets of the way the universe works. It's secret messages, it's how medicine is, philosophy, history, psychology, uh, and, 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 and that artist takes that information again, runs it through his mind, in his soul, and using contemporary uh, materials, creates an object in a new language that, that he has come up with and invented that explains his time and place on earth. And if that new language is important, that brings the clarity to a certain civilization. It uh, becomes the cultural language of that society and it becomes important and it's collected and it's displayed. And when you look back at it, you can see this is, this is what life was like and what artists were thinking and doing. And there's all these messages as you grow uh, in your life and just creating greater understanding through your travels, through your readings, through your connections, through your just exploring the world, you see these little rivulets of, of messages coming out of the paintings. The way I, I like to point it out, uh, there are two, very simply, two kinds of art, commercial art and fine art. Commercial art is like a very, very nicely, neatly wrapped package, looks pretty, you look at the commercial art, it gives you a message, you get it in two seconds. Feel this, do this, you know, activate on this. But fine art is like a very messily wrapped package with newspaper wrapped up very messily. There's strings hanging off it and it's, it's kind of weird. And you go, hmm, what does that newspaper article say? Oh, that's a newspaper article that said, uh, you know, Obama did this or JFK did that or this occurred somewhere. And God, well, I, I wonder, if I pull the string, uh, what will happen? Oh, then all of a sudden more information comes out. So that's like fine art. That's what fine art should be. Uh, I'm kind of a messily, somewhat not attractive package, but it's holding secrets and information. And as you grow in life, these little strings, and the, the paper changes shape, the strings fall off, and these little bits of information that are packed in by this genius that created it, uh, you become a, a much more educated and the painting is filled with all kinds of joy and excitement to live with. And you can live with it for decades. <laughs> I, I agree with that 100%. Uh, <laughs> I actually was trying to there say... There was high school. <laughs> I, I was trying to articulate that to uh, a friend this weekend when we were at a gallery show because I think too much of the public thinks that art is this thing that is hangs on the wall and it's painting or, or just a sort of limited thing. Where do you think artists fall short in that? In, in, I mean, we're not going to change the art education in, in our lifetime or, you know, in our, in our career. How can, how can we re-educate the public? Uh, how you can relate? It's, it's, you know, one person at a time. And, um, you know, just you know, coming upon them and, uh, you know, changing and then hoping that you can, you know, make them understand, you know, your view and, and, and make them then how your artwork can change their lives and make it more enjoyable and, and, and give them some insight. You know, some artists talk about their work, other artists don't, you know, talk about their work. And, um, you know, I, I like to explain artists' work if I can. Sometimes I can, sometimes I can't. Um, but you know, it's all, all slogging through and, and changing minds and, and creating a desire within people to, uh, 
you know, own, own, own something of, of wonderful, deep, intellect, intellectual, literally change your lives. I mean, when you go into a home that has artwork that is, makes you ask questions, artwork should make you ask questions. And uh, fine artwork should make you ask questions. And, um, you know, when you go into a home, you see, you know, terrible commercial artwork, you know, like Thomas Kincaid and that type of stuff. Um, oh, you know, yeah. oh, my God. Uh, and so you, you, you freak out. But when you see somebody that has a collection uh, that, is, that is nice and innovative and it's exciting and you, it's a surprise to see and it's joyful to uh, enter a, a home like that. Thanks, Austin. <laughs> My pleasure. Tasha, Thank this you. has been wonderful. Do you see yourself as typical, totally atypical? Are there any others of you out there? I mean, no. I can think of a few, but we don't run into a whole lot of you. No, no, no. I, I, I'm, I'm totally self-invented. I came from absolutely nowhere. And um, I, 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 absolutely, I dropped out basically in the third grade, just kind of sat in class uh, and waited to, to graduate. And I'm just incredibly lucky that I ended up in the art world, that it worked for me. Lucky that I met Monique, who is this Romanian gypsy from Transylvania, who I married. I asked her to marry me after three minutes of meeting her, that I knew that she would be able to change my life. You didn't, didn't you, Paul? Oh, totally. I can remember. You, you, I can remember when she, you guys came into my gallery in Chicago and I ripped my pants and she said, I will sew them. And I said, here, let me take them off. And she said, no, don't bother. <laughs> um, you know, but anyway, so we, I, I, we got married a year later, and I, I, but after ten minutes, I asked her to marry me, and I knew that. Then I brought her home to my parents. She's gonna be my wife. That's very nice. And so, uh, but I knew she'd be able to make my dreams come true by her vivaciousness and her excitement. So I finally, a year and a half later, came up with the art world and uh, I focused her on that, and and she created. I did the buying. I had the eyes, and she had the mouth. You need a mouth. Yeah, there's truth to that. All right. Yeah. I think we should wrap this up with that. I think this has been really fabulous. You remain the same wonderfully odd person I loved many years ago. Thank you, and, Paul. Um, I'm anticipating coming out and visiting. I want to see what Hunk and Moo have done at Stanford and, you know, check out the museum there. And I hope I can do that this fall. Um, Wait, say that again? Oh, I saw oh, before you before I go to Europe. I may wait till you get back when it's you know okay. cold here. I'll be, and... I'll be back at Christmas. Maybe then. I don't know. We will see. Well, Pastor, let me unmute everybody. This has been wonderful to visit with you. I am glad we have done this. A great Thank you.